Uh, shall we go back now to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 11? We mentioned to you last Sunday that this is kind of the final stretch or the home stretch of Solomon's long and sordid journey through the world with all of his power and wealth to find or try to find life as he called it under the sun, apart from God. And it has taken certainly years off of his life. It certainly took years of his life. He has chronicled every step, every move was written with lengthy kind of summations of his discoveries. He's been honest about what he has seen. He has been honest to tell us what he hoped to find, and then he has been honest to tell us what he actually discovered. And, and we talked about him early, that, that early on as a young man, God gave him wisdom like no one had ever possessed to replace his father David as the king of Israel. But later on in life, his wives that he married, some for political alliances, some for other reasons, they turned his heart away from God. And this is really the, the, the life of Solomon in the world. But as he turns for home, and in chapter 12, he certainly focuses upon the need again to go back to where he began, walking with God. He spends the last couple of chapters doing a lot of comparisons between the fool and the wise. The fool, by definition, is someone who's decided that they can live their life without God. They are the lost. The wise are those who have learned to live skillfully by surrendering their lives to the Lord, by seeking his will, by obeying his word and following the leading of his spirit. And so Solomon, in very poetic style, sets these contrasts before us as he heads for the conclusion, which is fear God. <laughs> that really is your life. Fear the Lord. Keep his commandments. Walk with him. Well, last week in the first <clears throat> 10 verses, we, we looked at a couple of things. We looked at how a little foolishness, even in the life of a wise man, a believer, can so quickly ruin their reputation and their influence. But yet in verse 2 and 3, how much foolishness is unable to be hidden in the life of the lost. It, it comes out in what he says and what he does and the way he behaves himself. He then turned and talked about foolish rulers in the world and how foolish responses from the believer can really undermine what God is wanting to do in them. And finally, he turned to talk about the fool's way of life, that he's not prepared for what comes next. He doesn't live a life of preparedness, and so everything's difficult for him. And then the end is worse. Whereas the wise man will plan ahead and prepare for the work ahead and be ready when the Lord comes. This morning in chapter 10 here, from verses 11 through 20, Solomon continues that comparison in very pronounced kind of Hebrew poetic style, but he turns this morning to our mouths or to the things that we say. I gave you a chance to leave. <clears throat> and he compares the mouths of the wise with the mouths or of the speech of the fool. In fact, he, he focuses specifically upon the fool and by contrast warns the wise that these are the things that probably shouldn't be showing up in the lives of the saints. But he'll talk about the babblers of the world and those given to indulging their mouth's desire of gossip and censure and, and malignment of others. Those of you that are parents probably remember if you have older kids that there was a time in your children's life where they had what was called, I called it the mouth phase. Everything they saw, they first put in their mouths, right? Didn't matter what it was, a stone, a toy, a fist, a cockroach, didn't matter. There it goes, you know, and it's gross to you, but it wasn't gross to them. They just kind of wanted to know what they're dealing with. The good news is that phase passes quickly. The bad news is trouble with our mouth does not. And here's what James says. I'll read you ten verses. If I read you the whole book, we'd all just die. So we can only take parts of James at once. <laughs> My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing you will receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. But if anyone does not stumble in his words, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires." Even so, the, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire can kindle. Well, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, and the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sits on fire the course of nature, 
and it is set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea we have tamed. It has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil filled with deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who has made us in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? God bless you. I was trying to get that to you earlier, but read it. Our mouths do get us in trouble, don't they? We, we bless people, we help them, we encourage them, and then we can turn right around and confuse them and hurt them and destroy them. Jesus said, it isn't what comes out of your mouth that really defiles you. Sorry, what goes into your mouth. But it is what comes out of your mouth that defiles you because, as he said there in Matthew 15, it comes out of your heart. So this morning and to the end of chapter 10, Solomon speaks to us about the mouth of a fool. And words that we want to pay attention to because we're to be witnesses in the world. And, and certainly our greatest influence can often be in what we say and don't say and how we say it. And boy, you can sure undermine the message you bring by your mouth. Verse 11. A serpent may bite when it is not charmed. The babbler, no different. The words of a wise man, they are of a wise man's mouth, they are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. I heard a wise man once say that it, the best way to save face is to keep the bottom of it closed. <laughs> There's some truth to that. Speech is usually how we communicate. You know, we use body language. If you cut someone off on the freeway, they may even use sign language <laughs> to express how they feel. But, but for the most part, you make yourself and, and the things that matter to you known by your speech. So it's important that we choose our words wisely. James went so far as to say in what we just read, that if anyone would not stumble with his words, he would be a perfect man able to bridle his entire body. Or literally, a person who shows great restraint in their words is probably someone who is disciplined in every area of their life because it is the most difficult area to bring uh, kind of under, if you will. Even with the best of intentions and carefulness, words can be misunderstood. We can use them improperly or hurt someone without knowing, be insensitive to what we say. And those are for the saints. Just imagine someone who has no concern at all for where their words run and what they accomplish. We read here in verse 11 that sin is very destructive. Solomon says that just as an unattended snake may suddenly without warning bite you even though you're not messing with it or charming it, eventually the words and the communication of a babbler will as well. A babbler, what a name. Wagging, undisciplined, loose tongue from an unattended wicked heart who cuts and bites and destroys and has an edge, words that are carelessly spewed out. Solomon would write in Proverbs, and by the way, he says a lot about the tongue. But in chapter 12, verse 18 of Proverbs, Solomon says, There is one who can speak like the piercings of a sword, while the tongue of the wise man will promote health. The blessing versus the cursing, the destruction versus the, the building up. Do you know anybody who has a sharp tongue? That every word has a biting edge, the, the verbal terminator? <laughs> How often have you said something and you say, oh, I should have said that. And you want to be like fishing, you wish you could just reel them in, but they're out there, aren't they? And what we usually do is we immediately say, uh oh, shouldn't have said that, and we go into damage control. So people will say this, well, look, what I meant to say was, <laughs> And what you say in your heart is, yeah, exactly what you said is what you meant to say. But notice a babbler will talk and talk and talk and, and like an un, kind of attended snake, without warning, he'll, he'll get you, won't he? It is best to stay away from those who talk constantly. However, not only does he hurt others, notice at the end of verse 12, he also hurts himself. The lips of a fool are going to swallow him up. You can lose your friends by not having control of your mouth, or, or you can lose a job, or your reputation, or your credibility. You, de you develop a, 
uh, people understand that that's how you are. A, a sharp tongue can invite a split lip, a fist sandwich. Babblers are self-destructive. And they're void of, devoid of any contact tense. Notice verse 12. The words of a wise man, out of the mouth of the, of the believer comes grace, encouragement, support. Verse 13 says, the words of his mouth, the, the fool, begins with foolishness and ends with raving madness. He starts with nonsense and goes south from there. Talk is cheap. More foolishness with every word. And if you listen to people that aren't saved and they begin to tell you about their philosophies of life, it's almost like quicksand in their mouth. Every word you just sink deeper, don't you? But what does James say in chapter 5? He said, look, you let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Beyond that, nothing's really going to help. Be, be clear, but babbling is just a, a, a worldly way of life that, that shows you don't know a thing because you've got to keep talking until you get it all out. According to verse 13, babblers begin with a, without a valid premise. And then they become more unreasonable as they talk. In the end, I like Solomon's words, raving madman. You ever start talking with somebody who's not saved about eternal things, and then they, they start to tell you their philosophy, and pretty soon you're going, you've got to be kidding me. And the more they talk, the less they, they even understand what they're saying. But they're on a roll now. Don't stop me while I'm on a roll. It's interesting how quickly and weirder their premises become. It's a far cry from what, what Solomon says in Proverbs 25, that a word that is fitly spoken are like apples of gold in settings of silver. They stand out. They're, they're framed. They, they, they leave an impact, if you will. A fool's words aren't like that. They're not full. They're not powerful. They're empty. They're devoid of content. I, I, I watched a guy in a parking lot the other night, argue with another guy, and, and I thought maybe there'd be a fight, but, but this guy was proficient at profanity. I mean, he was good at using curse words as adjectives, nouns, adverbs, you know, <laughs> modifiers. And I thought to myself, in thinking of this study which I had been working on, you know, Profanity is a pretty good example of people who fill their speech with fillers, you know? They don't really say anything. I mean, profanity, by and large, doesn't say anything. It just kind of fills the sentence. It's like a pause. <laughs> and, and, and the world is good at just, they just kind of take that all in. It doesn't matter to them. It kind of comes in one ear and, and goes out the other. But it, I, I, you hear it everywhere. I, I did a funeral 10 or 15 years ago of a fellow that was a Christian guy in our church who got killed in a motorcycle accident. But his brother wasn't saved, and he got up in the pulpit, in, in this pulpit, and man, the things he said. But I had to come up after him, and I thought, what do I say about this poor guy? His heart's broken, but his words didn't really fit here. And I just kind of let it go, but I thought, you know, it's just the way the world is. On Easter this year, I had a fella catch me in the parking lot as I was going to my car, and he said, hey, hell of a sermon, Pastor. Well, thank you. I think. I don't know for sure. But he, actually, what I said to him was, you don't go to church that often, eh? That's what I said to him. You open your Bible and you go to Colossians chapter 4, and it says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you might know how you ought to answer one another. There's such a difference between a heart that is right with God and a heart that is not in terms of what comes out of our mouths. And, and not that we don't battle with that, but the distinction has to be clear. It has to be different, you and I, from the babbler in the world. The children of the king should use the language of the king. And so often we don't. We should be encouraging and uplifting and fitting, not empty words without content. We should be that grace that comes from the lips of the saints. Notice in verse 14 that we read, A fool, he just multiplies his words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? But the labor of fools wearies them. They don't even know how to go to the city. Babbling is, is a disproportionate response to the need. In other words, they add more words than the situation demands. The babbler, the lost, 
have no end to their speaking, no control at all. They did a survey a few years ago, or a study, I should say, and it, had, it was an interesting find that, that each day the average person speaking in his normal life could fill a book with 50 pages of printed text. 50 pages a day. In a year, 132 volumes of 400 pages each. So when you read later on in the Bible that every word will be brought into judgment, think about those volumes you're putting on the shelf. 132 volumes, 400 pages each, directly credited to you. Over your average lifetime, 3,000 volumes, a million and a half pages. That's for the average person. Some of you have multiple libraries. <laughs> Solomon will write in Proverbs 10, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. And then he writes in chapter 17 of Proverbs, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. And ten chapters later he wrote, a fool will vent all of his feelings, but a wise man will hold them back. Sometimes the greatest wisdom is shown by what is not said. Because the world is known for its much talk that goes nowhere. The success of talk shows ought to convince you that we're not going anywhere. Everybody wants to give their two cents. Let me make, I hope they get my call. I'm going to tell them what I think. Well, that'll be great. And then someone else will tell them what they think. And then it'll be Tuesday. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer, that, that prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples when they said, Lord, teach us to pray, is 56 words long. But boy, is it powerful. The Ten Commandments, 290 words long. That's it. Gettysburg Address, I think, is 256. Declaration of Independence, 300 words. You seen the latest budget book? <laughs> Volume 1. More babble, less content. Look, babbling takes place when your heart and your mouth are out of sync and when your heart is far removed from God. It's like turning the water hose on in the backyard just walking away. It's just going to keep spewing until somebody puts an end to it. You know? But I love how Solomon puts it here. A fool, he just adds more words. Every time he's got more words. And then he's, he, he says kind of tongue-in-cheek a couple of verses. Look, no man knows what's coming next, but you're not going to tell the fool that. In fact, the fool gets weary of, of trying to get to him. He doesn't even know his way home. Now, I don't know if the end of verse 15 is a colloquial phrase, you know, that, that maybe it was used during that time. It, it makes sense. It's almost a sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek, you know, comment. He, he doesn't even know his way home. He's too foolish to know the route of an elevator, that kind of thing, you know. He doesn't know to come out of the rain. But, but notice foolish talkers, they speak as if they know the future, something no one really knows, because they have an answer for everything. They can't be taught. They know it all. So you can't counsel them. You can't give them insight. They have no time to look ahead. They're too busy telling you what's going on. If you've ever had to sit and try to counsel a babbler, it's hard. They don't listen. Your entire job in counseling a babbler is to do this. Mm hmm, I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. It's an absolute waste of time. They don't want answers. They have answers. They just want you to echo what they have told you and pat them on the back and agree with them. Be careful of being a babbler. So, the foolish babbler is the first topic, Solomon. Then he turns to the overseer, the one who is foolish and is interested only in himself. He says, woe to the land or to the nation or to the people when they have a king who is a child and whose princes feast in the morning. But blessed is that land or nation or people when the king is the son of a noble and the princes they feast at the proper time. They feast for strength and not for drunkenness. Solomon turns to say there are people who are just interested in feeding their mouths 
or their desires. They are overindulgent folks. Solomon, because he was a king, spends much time talking about leadership. Good leaders and bad, the, the wise and the foolish. He, he, he now speaks about the indulgent mouth. And in fact, if you read down through verse 19, you will find words like feast and drunkenness and laziness and idleness and wine and money. It's all about that leader who is devoid of a relationship with God. And Solomon uses the example of those who have too much time on their hands and too many resources at their disposal. And so they use those things for self-gain. They eat and drink to excess. Notice his poetic style in verse 16. He said, you know, the, the land is in trouble when it has a king who is not mature and whose rulers under him are allowed to just party it up in the morning, literally drunk before noon. Everything's a party. Why? I've got money to spend and, 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 and private planes to use and cash funds that aren't mine to dispense. Sound a little familiar? But blessed is the land when they have a mature leader who comes from a family stock of others who have been good leaders, whose overseers under him feast at the proper time. They, they eat for strength rather than for drunkenness. And the comparison between the drinking to get drunk to excess versus those who have proper times to eat to maintain their strength to serve. Isaiah wrote in chapter 5, Woe to those that are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine and valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a, a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Indulgence, gluttony. <laughs> It'll ruin you. It's the world's way. It shouldn't be our way. It, it goes right along with that restraint in speech. You may get opportunity to serve yourself, but there isn't any entitlement program with Christ. You're entitled to repent. You're entitled to be forgiven. You're entitled to be a servant. When all is said and done, say of yourself, I am a worthless servant. We are not entitled to take advantage of the places that God puts us. That's a worldly characteristic. The Roman Empire fell from within because it had no su sufficient internal base to stand anymore. It just collapsed because of this indulgence. So when a king is immature and his officers are self-serving, the people suffer, the future is, is bleak, the land is in trouble. Those leading it oftentimes are placed like that though by the Lord when folks aren't willing to walk with God. God oftentimes give them immature leaders who serve themselves as punishment, as judgment. Let me read to you in chapter 3, what the Lord said in Isaiah, to the people in much the same condition. He said, Behold, the Lord of hosts says, Take away from Jerusalem and Judah the stock and the store, the supply of bread and water, the mighty man or man of war, the counselor and skillful artisan, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty, and of honorable men. Take away the expert enchanter. I will give children to be their princes, Babes will rule over them, and the people will be oppressed. Everyone by another, everyone by his neighbor. The children will be insolent towards their elder, the base towards the honorable. And when a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, he will say, You have clothing, you can be our ruler. And let these ruins be under your power. And that day he will protest, saying, I can't cure your ills. For in my house is neither food nor clothing. Do not make me a ruler of the people, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah is fallen. And because of their tongue and because of their doings, as they are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory, uh, to the eyes of his glory, he's bringing babes in to rule. Isaiah, in looking at the people of his day, said, God's given you weak, immature, and self-serving rulers because your tongue and your doings are against the Lord. It, it was a built-in kind of punishment for the nation. And Solomon mentions it here, woe to the land when they get leadership that is immature and self-serving. Blessed are the land when they get servants who serve others, who are self-denying, who are wise in their ways. And certainly, God help us. Verse 18 adds to their indulgence the word incompetence. Because of laziness, the building decays, and through their idleness, the hand of their hands, the house is leaking. 
Decay happens over time. And here's what you have to do to see decay. Do nothing. Decay will just come your way. It's the result of doing nothing. And that's true in almost every area of your life. You want to see rot? Don't, you know, don't paint the house. Don't mow the lawn. Don't pull the weeds. Don't clean. Just do nothing. And notice the two words that dominate the sentences, laziness and idleness. There's no drive or willingness, and there's no activity. Because the man of the world is only interested in pleasing himself. So his spiritual life might fall apart, but man, he's got all the comforts of the world. He's up on that category. Laziness and lethargy can ruin the house. From a leadership standpoint, you know, that can happen to all of us. If you don't have good leaders, offices fall apart. You know, positions that are held by those who, who lead bear fruit. I had a teacher one time in my Bible school say, you want to know if you're a leader, turn around and see who's following you. A badge doesn't make an elder. Eldering makes an elder. I remember being at Costa Mesa years ago and someone said to Pastor Chuck when I was standing with him, who are your elders? He said, look around, they're eldering. They're doing the work. Well, here Solomon points to those who are incompetent in the place that they find themselves. When Paul wrote to Timothy about the deacons and ordaining deacons in the church, he says, let these first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Talk is cheap, but action is where it at. Notice, notice the fool is self-serving. The saints serve others, and their lives show it. That's the distinction. Solomon, in looking around, said, man, there's a lot of self-service out in the world. We just got back from Israel, and I think one of the, the best examples, at least in a, in a viewpoint sense, is, is if you go to the Sea of Galilee in the north, the Sea of Galilee has, has three sources of water that flow into it, a couple of underwater springs, and then the runoff of snow from Mount Hermon, which is kind of on the border between Lebanon and Syria and Israel, provides uh, at least half of Israel's drinking water, so it's always well protected. But, you know, everything around the Sea of Galilee is, 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 is rich and green and verdant, and, and the people rely upon its water to drink. And then it flows south down the Jordan River, and it kind of waters wherever it goes. On the other end of that stream is the Dead Sea. It, it, it only takes in. It never gives out, and it's dying. If you go to the Dead Sea down in the wilderness, it looks like the moon. There are sinkholes and... Nothing grows, there's no greenery, it is just dark and brown and, and sad. But it's a pretty good picture of, of, of no outlet. It only draws things in and it leaves deadness in its wake. The fool. Verse 19 adds to indulgence and incompetence indifference. A feast is made for laughter. Wine is made for merry. Money can fix everything. The outlook of the fool. Here's his philosophy of life. Drink and drink some more. Eat all you want. Take all you can. Live it up. <laughs> if you need help, hey, money will buy you out of it. I'm above the fray. I'm above the problem. I've got all the money I need. How deceived is the fool? What does the saint do? He dies to himself. He serves others. He thinks of others before himself. And finally, he speaks of the, the it goes back to the issue of speech. And he says, don't curse the king even in your thought, the rich even in your bedroom, because of the bird of the air may carry your voice and an in-flight bird may tell the matter. Now Solomon was king when he wrote, do not curse the king. Maybe a little self-serving, but it does have a wider application for all of us because there is a bunch of slander and wicked talk that is constantly found, certainly in the world, but unfortunately can find its way into the church. But, but wicked talk always begins with self-talk. You don't usually say those things until you've thought about them. And in the privacy of your bedroom, by poetic license, when you begin to confide in others that you think you can trust, don't think that you can because wicked speech has a life of its own. And it somehow is able to get out, isn't it? And in a place we believe was safe to voice our opinion, 
that speech never stays hidden. That's not the way you and I as Christians are supposed to live. The Bible is replete with encouragements to us to be transparent, to be encouraging, to bless and to inspire, to be you know, open, uh, everything's on the table, no hidden agenda, no two-faced comments. And unfortunately, when you whisper in the ears of some, it'll come shouting out of someone else's mouth. Complainers and slanderers mark themselves. In Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon wrote, Six things does God hate. No, seven things are an abomination to him. And that escalation of number is not, oh, I forgot, I remembered one more. It's, it's again, Hebrew poetry, it's the exclamation point when you, when you ascend in numbers. So, six things, no seven. In other words, these are important, listen to these. And three of the seven listed there in Proverbs 6 have to do with our mouths. A lying tongue, he hates. A false witness, he hates. He who sows discord among the brethren, he hates. God hates. Those who bring division to relationship and sever friendships and disrupt fellowship for the sake of their mouths running on and on. But it goes from your thought to a trusted companion and soon everyone knows. Telephone, telegraph, unfortunately sometimes tell the church and the word gets out. And notice he says a bird of the air may carry your voice and a bird in flight may tell the matter. Notice it isn't just in an open mouth that's the problem. There's a lot of open ears that are the problems as well. Have you ever heard someone you know, is asked, how do you know that? And they'll say, a little birdie told me. That's where that little phrase comes from. So not only is, is, is the, the, the talking, the, the indiscretion, the maligning speech an issue, but, but those of you that are willing hearers, you're also a problem. Now we're going to run into this again in a few weeks, and I suspect Solomon thought it was important enough to cover twice, kind of from different angles, because it is such a big issue but may I suggest to you that the next time someone wants to share with you, just want you to pray, bro. Just want to tell you, I trust you. Do you know what else to talk to about you? To bring the latest gossip your way, let, let me suggest five questions you ask them. It'll stop it, because I get a lot of this. People go, hey, pastor, do you know about someone? I don't want to hear it. So here's the five questions that use them. Number one, I always ask them, why are you telling me that? Why do I need to know that? What do you want me to do with that information? Second of all, where did you get your information from? Who are your sources? And people usually don't want to tell you. Well, you know, I just heard. No, no, I'd like to know names. I want to know who you spoke to so I can use you and your source. No, no never mind, Pastor. Thirdly, I always say to them, have you gone directly to that person and talked to them yourself? That's invariably a no, because gossipers don't like re resolving problems. They just like talking about them. Fourthly, have you checked out the facts? Do you know what you're telling me is true? Or did someone just tell you that? Are you just a mouthpiece for the last guy to lie to you? And fifthly, if it gets that far, I I'll always say, can I quote you? Oh, no, 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 it's a confidence. can't quote you. And that's a problem, isn't it? So five good questions to ask. Now, look, we've we got to be wise in our walks with God. And we need to really ask the Lord to help us to control our tongues. James said, no man can do it without God's help. And if we don't have his help, our mouths are going to get us into a lot of trouble, and it's going to bring great destructions all around. And yet, the church is placed out into the world by the Lord to be the light of the world. We don't want to set fires except in the hearts of men. So we need God's help. Babblers have many words and no content, and they are destructive by nature. They multiply words as their irrational conclusions go forward. I've always found it very interesting that people that hold very odd views of theology require hours to explain them to you. But if you just know the Lord, it's simple, isn't it? It doesn't take much. A few sentences, the gospel is clear. But the weirdo who has the weirdo ideas, 
He's got to just, let me just tell you, it'll only take an hour. Well, if it takes an hour, it probably ain't right. May God keep us from indulgence and indiscretion. Those are the ways of the fool, not God's people. Maybe this week you could watch every word you say. Ask God to be glorified with your mouth. You're right, that's too much. Let's see if we can make it to lunch. (laughs) Father, thank you this morning for gathering us together. We do pray, Lord, that you might guide our steps and watch over our lives. And, and Lord, that you would be the Lord of what we say. Certainly the world is filled with talk. Everyone loves to talk. We love to talk. We love to tell a secret, hear a secret, hear a story. I'll keep it to myself. Have you heard the latest? What, what foolishness grips our hearts when, Lord, what you'd want out of our mouths as your people is grace, encouragement, blessing. Love covering a multitude of sin. What we find so often is the world dressed up like a Christian. And we're anything but. And as Solomon looks at the world and as he, he heads for the conclusion of his years of journeying in the world, he, he lays out for us what he saw, the fool in his, his mouth and his foolishness. And then the saint with grace. That's what we want, Lord. We want to stand out to the world, not just in the gospel that we preach, but in the way that we live and wear that gospel. So we don't undermine the message we bring by the way that we live or the things that we say. Maybe that's your story. Your mouth is just out of control. You're a gossiper. You love to tell a good story. You you do it all the time. You'd be embarrassed to have people walk in on the conversations you have. You're opinionated. You're harsh. And God would want you to be gracious, kind, to bless, to curse not. So that the message that you bring and the gospel that you preach will be adorned with the words that you speak and the love that you show. Don't let the enemy have that place because the fools in the world will train us well. But our God would have us to speak like him. You need prayer this morning. All of the pastors will be up front. You can come and just grab one of them and say, could you pray with me? We certainly believe that praying together, God moves mountains. And this morning he can meet you right here. Shall we stand?